My name is Bickle. Bernard Bickle. I, I am rather well known as a space traveller and also an authority of some standing in the field of symbological euphonics, the study of alien musics on the many far worlds scattered about this galaxy of ours. I have been commissioned by Dame Isabel Grace, the eminent secretary treasurer of the Opera League, to recount the history of our recent little adventure in space when we endeavoured to bring the finest music of Earth to the attention of the inhabitants of a number of these far worlds. Dame Isabel is anxious to dispel the rumours that have surfaced as tittle-tattle and gossip in journalistic circles. I shall not omit recounting the several awkward instances that befell us. There were various levels of understanding. Yes. Our story begins at the opera. Dame Isabel is in her private box, discussing the program that will shortly be presented. A ballet by the Ninth Troop, a dance group brought to Earth by the enterprising space captain Adolf Gondar from the distant planet Rolaru. Dame Isabel is as usual accompanied by her favorite nephew, Roger Wool, and an admiring group of music critics, but the critics are dubious regarding Gondar. It is our business to be sceptical. Who ever heard of a credulous critic? My objections are based partly on musical theory and partly on an informed layman's knowledge of the galaxy. I find it hard to believe that an alien race could employ a comprehensible musical idiom. And also, I have never heard of the planet Raru, which presumably exhibits a highly advanced civilization. You are a fool! Unfair! Unfair! We are all poor mortals pushing through our various dark thickets. Bernard Bickle, who probably knows... Don't mention that name to me. He is an opinionated poser, completely superficial. He is probably the world's leading authority on comparative musicology. We cannot help but be influenced by his views. The curtain rises on stage. The Rolaru Ninth Ballet Troupe perform a fetch on Petra in garments of pink, green, and yellow, engaging hybrids of fairies and harlequins. Apparently, aimless motion, curtsies, caperings, and canterings. Thank you. 
flash of dazzling blue-green light reveals the players in frozen attitudes of attention and inquiry. I note a certain absence of discipline, praiseworthy exuberance, an attempt to break away from traditional forms, but as you say, in Kuwait. Good evening, Madam Grace. Thank you for your invitation. Good evening to you too, sir. A pair of buffoons. Come, Roger. Uh, I believe I will leave you here. I have an engagement. You have nothing of the sort. You are driving me to Lillian Monteagle's supper party. not attended the ballet, but I had always enjoyed being lionised at Lillian Monteagle's parties. As we waltzed around, the conversation was entirely about Gondar's Rolaru Ballet. Perhaps I pontificated somewhat more than usual, hmm. and it was this that, that prompted Dame Isabel's grand idea. Want to pay him? Why should he not take the money? Why should he not take the money? of this troop. I, 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 I say this much. I have never heard of the planet Rolaru, or however it's pronounced. And as you know, I have travelled space a great deal. But, Mr Pickle, I think you're being dreadfully unfair. You haven't even gone to one of their performances. I have, and I was absolutely thrilled. And of Gondar, whoever or whatever he may be, undoubtedly is a fantastically good showman. Oh, I must take issue with you. Adolf Gondar is totally inept as a showman, though he is probably a competent captain of spaceships, for this is his trade. Oh, this would, of course, lend colour to his claims. As for myself, modesty aside, I am close to top of a field that has been called comparative musicology or symbological euphonics, or just plain musicology, and I simply refuse to be hornswoggled by the mysterious Adolf Gondar. His music is comprehensible, which is the giveaway. Music is like a language. You cannot understand it unless you learn it. Or more accurately, are born. Thank you. 
If certain conditions are satisfied, <laughs> music is a communication, emotional communication to be sure. And this implies agreement as to the context of the symbology. Do you follow me? Naturally. I am secretary treasurer of the Opera League. Totally strange place on a t- 
totally strange planet on a totally strange planet. Using instruments similar to our own, I nearly find it hard to believe, hard to believe, musical symbols of an alien race could mesh so completely, mesh so completely with our own as to us, a class emotionally. As to us, a class emotionally. Is this not reasonable? Is this not reasonable? Very reasonable. So reasonable as to indicate a flagrant fallacy in your chain of logic. The facts are these. I personally have sponsored Mr. Gondar. I am in full financial control of the tour of the Ninth Company. And I am not a woman to be fooled. I suggest you attend a performance. You may, if you like, join me in my box tomorrow. Uh, I shall look. I shall look into my appointments. Uh, and if at all possible, I shall do Excuse so. Excuse me, madam. Mr. Gondar is here. An urgent message. Well, Adolf, what is the trouble? The Ninth Company has disappeared. The next morning, in the sober light of day, Captain Gondar reports to Dame Isabel in the drawing room of her beautiful old home, the magnificent Bellu. Isabel's ancestral home was exquisite. The sun shone through the long, elegant windows, looking onto the beautifully kept lawns. After the performance, I escorted the troupe up to the theatre penthouse. They fed themselves and seemed a comfort to be settled for the night. When I looked in later, they had disappeared. The 
Deck attendants rose, no air vehicles arrived or departed. And the science has been known nothing about. I think they decided to go. it myself. On Raru I've seen things I can't describe. Musical productions which are absolutely overwhelming. Apparently I suppose you'd call them the night company is what you'd call light, is what you'd call light. Have returned to the room by some. 
means beyond my knowledge. They've returned to Laru, my son, means beyond my knowledge. <laughs> For the Ninth Company to persuade them to visit Earth. I was on Rularu for about four months. I learned something of the language. When I saw the quality of the performances, I mentioned that on Earth we had similar activities and that perhaps we could affect a cultural exchange program. No difficulties were made. I brought the Ninth Company to Earth and in due course proposed to take an Earth group to Rularu. There is a highly developed science on the planet? I wouldn't say that. Things aren't quite that simple. No one seems to work so hard. The aristocrats are the musicians and the pantomimists. At the bottom, a class of vagrants. No talent indigents. You did not explore very thoroughly. I was given to understand that it wasn't, well, safe to go everywhere. No one told me why. Well, well, this is highly interesting. The Opera League is meeting tonight. I shall report what you have told me and recommend that the cultural exchange programme be kept up. I'm not so sure that it's a feasible project. In fact, now that I think of it, for reasons of my own, I do not care to leave Earth. Not at the present time. Mr Gondar, I am never ambiguous or untruthful. And I demand that everyone I deal with act in a similar manner. You made the assertion that the Ninth Company of Rlaru came to Earth as half of a cultural exchange scheme. Yes, of course, but... Is this statement true or untrue? Naturally, it's true. If However... it is true, the obligation is definite. Those persons who are attacking our good faith must be refuted. By arranging a visit to Rlaru by a group of representative musicians, or if necessary, by turning the money over to some worthy charity. Do you not agree? Very well. Organise your tour. A week later, I was invited to Bellu as Roger Wool's guest. Roger was a likeable, but rather lackadaisical young man.
appalling. She wants to visit other worlds along the way to Laro. You yourself have influenced her with your description of the hydrogated entry caps, listening to music from your But it's all so ridiculous, those particular creatures. For merely wondering how I managed to confine so many insects, so many insects, which locally produce loud shrill noises, into so small a box. Your aunt's concept, excuse me. I speak frankly. Is it idiotic? Is it idiotic? and place absolutely baronial it must be hundreds of years old she's been strongly influenced by your Set my arm straight. It must be hundreds of Some way to set my arms straight. It must be hundreds of Some way to set my arms straight. This is a beautiful place which will be mine. Someday I don't want to find it sold at auction. You'll probably find her on the rose terrace. Good news indeed. Mr. Bickle has agreed to join our little tour among the planets. He'll be musical consultant at an exorbitant salary, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> but we will have his specialised knowledge to guide us. I will be utterly honest. You could not have hired a better man. Roger, are you not staying for dinner?
The tour preparations were soon in full swing. At the spaceport, the ship Phoebus is being loaded with a transportable opera stage and large numbers of musicians and singers under the command of maestro Sir Henry Rickson. Dame Isabel inspects the company. Roger is having a severe attack of blues. Suddenly, he is approached by a very pretty girl. Isabel Grace. Yes, indeed. You are absolutely correct. You couldn't be more so. And who is that man talking to her? That's Mr. Bickle, a musical expert, or so he fancies himself. <laughs> and are you a musician? Uh, yes, in a way. Oh, really? Yes, indeed. I play the... Uh, uh, well, I'm one of those all-round types. Um, who are you? 
That's a question I can't answer, because I'm not absolutely sure. But I'll tell you my name, if you'll tell me yours. I'm Roger Wall. You're associated with Dame Isabel Grace? Hmm, she's my aunt. Indeed. And you're going on this expedition out among the planets? I'd like to travel space too. You haven't told me your name. It's a strange name, from Wales, Merion even, though I'm the only one left. Magic Roswin. I know what. I'll take you out to lunch and you can tell me all about yourself. Roger takes Maddock off. The spaceship crew, musicians and opera singers break for lunch. A few eat their sandwiches on low benches while a few dance in pairs. An old couple take the floor briefly. And then a young couple dance a delicate part de deux. Roger returns from his tete-a-tete. He is now holding Maddock by the hand.
If necessary, I'll get you on board as a stowaway. You will marry me, won't you? the Phoebus in space, the mess deck breakfast queue as the ship's company shuffle along with their trains. Roger Wool queues for his breakfast and then disappears to his room. Then he reappears and queues again for second helpings. a man with a good appetite I happen to be hungry I can't see where you store all that grub You don't have the look of a big eater Isabel is suffering badly from space sickness. summoned Roger to her cabin. He enters, escorted by a security officer. Yes. To particularize, I allude to the presence of your paramour aboard the ship. Do not interrupt!
Roger enters. He looks at Maddock, who ignores him. He approaches the captain. I understand that my aunt has placed Miss Roswin in your custody. That is correct, Mr. Wool. Will you allow me to have a few private words with her? If Miss Roswin is willing to talk with you, it's certainly agreeable to me. Please, Mr. Wool, say what you want to say, and then... My darling, what's wrong? What's wrong? The mess you've got me in, the things you've said about me, it's a wonder I have a shred of reputation left. I don't understand. I've merely... You've nearly got me in the worst trouble I've ever been in. I'm thankful if I know you for the selfish blunderer you are before you did worse than you've done. Now please go, and never speak to me again. Again in Dame Isabel's cabin. The ship's engines are running smoothly, but Dame Isabel is still suffering. Captain Gondar enters.
Yes, Captain. How is everything going? Everything seems first rate, madam. I've made arrangements in regard to the young lady whom I fear your nephew has attempted to victimise. What? Roger? Victimise anyone except me? Certainly not that devious little trollop. Eventually you'll hear the full truth, madam. In the meantime, the young lady is not only filled with remorse, but wants to make amends for the trouble she has unwittingly caused. Mr. Wool tricked her aboard. She was drugged and locked in a storage closet. Mr. Wool made periodic attempts to assault her, but without success. <laughs> if it's true, though I doubt it, it's about the level of competence I would expect of Roger. He has a girl locked in a closet, drugged and helpless, and still she fends him off. Well, 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 poor Roger. The young lady learned that you were suffering from space sickness. She tells me she knows a specific cure and will be happy to help you. The way I feel, I'd take help from the devil himself. What is this cure? To celebrate the imminent arrival of the spaceship Phoebus on planet Sirius, a champagne party has been organized for the entire company on the mess deck. has adapted to the circumstances of the voyage. Ahead of us lies Sirius, and Sirius Planet, which for most of us will be a first venture on an alien world. There is flora and fauna, unlike anything with which we are familiar. And in fact, the words flora and fauna are probably misnomers, as many of the Sirius life forms fit neither category or fit them both. There is an intelligent native population which is, of course, the reason for our visit. Mr. Bickle will tell us more about the natives who happen to live in caves and potholes. We must be careful to avoid parochialism. It is possible the Byzantors, as this race is called, regard us as primitive. <laughs> I have given a good deal of thought to the choice of our first programme. We want to communicate with our audience, but still hold our artistic integrity at its highest levels. To this end, we must select works which offer the largest possible number of situations with which they can identify their own existence. I have decided that Fidelio will be our first offering, since much of the action occurs in a dungeon, not unlike the blowholes in which the Byzantors live. I can fill in one or two details regarding the Byzantors, as the Sirius natives are known, as I have had occasion to visit Sirius three, or, or is it four times previously. In any event, I know Commandant Bolson at the settlement well, and look forward to renewing our acquaintance. 
Sirius Planet is a rather dim place, about as bright as an Earth twilight. One's eyes rapidly adapt, and the landscape takes on a weird charm. We land at Sirius Settlement, and nearby live the royal giant Byzantors, probably the most civilised tribe on the planet. Like the uh, landscape, I fear they will seem initially ugly to your eyes, and they are certainly not anthropoid. They have four arms and four legs, and what appear to be two heads. But these latter simply contain the sense organs, as the brain is in the body itself. In spite of their nightmarish appearance, they are responsive creatures, quite ready to adapt those human manners, methods and institutions which seem useful to them. We may be able to implant some glimmer of our musical heritage into a people curiously deficient in this regard. Who knows? Perhaps our visit will trigger a complete a revolution in the lives of the Byzantors. Sunrise on Sirius Planet. Sirius shines with a cool white glare on the bare expanse of the spaceport parade ground, where the company is at attention before a high podium on which stand the black-clad figure of my old friend the Commandant, flanked by the very large grotesque that is a Zant. Commandant, lovely as ever in tight black leather, trips down from the podium to inspect the parade. I'm Dyrus Paulson, Commandant. Welcome to Sirius Settlement. It doesn't look like much at first sight, and believe me, it gets worse. As I understand it, you propose to 
to stage an opera for the boys and tours. One of my responsibilities is to prevent abuse or exploitation of the Zans. I don't see how showing them an opera can hurt them. And not just an opera, Fidelio. And not just an opera, dismissed. A tea table is brought and tea is served to Dame Isabel, Captain Gondar and Commandant Dyrus Bolson accompanied by the monstrous Zant. Bolson explains the Zant's strange taboos and invites them to attend the opera production. Yeah. 
While I enjoy a chat to catch up with Dyrus Bolson, Roger sees Maddock being very friendly with the handsome astrogator Logan the Appling. ourselves comprehensible to the Byzantors. They seem completely non-human in their attitudes. In certain ways, yes. Sometimes I wonder at how closely our judgments mesh. I'll say this, if you want to present a program that the Zants can relate to, you're going to have to take them on their own terms. Naturally, naturally. We are prepared to do so. Can you offer us any suggestions? Probably not. Well, let's think further. As I recall, Fidelio, are not certain scenes played in a dungeon? Quite correct. Almost the whole of Act Two. 
You must remember that a dungeon is a cherished home to the Zants. The deranged, the troublemakers, are expelled to the plain, where they roam in bands. Incidentally, warn your company not to wander off by themselves. Well, well, well. I suppose we can make some changes easily enough. Act one in the dungeon, and act two in the open. Then there's also costuming. Do you know what the Zants call us in their own language? Sky lice. Mm. Exactly. If you costumed your sky lice players to resemble Zants, you'd command a much higher degree of attention. Where in the world will we get such costumes? I have some tanned Byzantor pelts in the warehouse. If you like, I'll have them brought to the ship. To a successful performance. is tranquil and beautiful at sunset. Maddock is again canoodling with the handsome astrogator Logan de Appling as eerie noises emerge from the undergrowth. Roger sees and despairs. In the cold light of morning, the singers arrive one by one to prepare for Fidelio. They warm up their voices, then try on their Zant costumes, the pelts provided by the Commandant. sensibilities of our audience. Perhaps you will inform me how I can express myself with four arms and how, conceivably how, can I achieve a projection behind these wads oh, and folds? Yeah. The skins smell quite badly. I think the whole idea is ridiculous. There will be no argument. These are the costumes for the performance and I will brook no insubordination. Your contracts are quite specific on this point. You are not required to risk your health, but a certain amount of discomfort must be expected and tolerated cheerfully. I will not put up with temperamental outbursts. Now then, everyone, the word dungeon is not to be used. 
we substitute the word desert. What difference does it make? We sing in German which the local beats can't understand in the first place. Our aim, Mr Scantling, is for faithfulness, for a basic intensity. If the scene represents a desert, which it now does, then a falsity is committed in referring to this desert as a dungeon, even in German. Do I make myself clear? The meter is changed. Die Wüste der Bügferlis. You must do your best. a shame after you've done so much to help. You did arrange that the local folk should come to the performance. Oh yes, they know all about it and at three o'clock they'll be here. With luck I'll be back for the last act. Maybe, maybe, maybe the Zants are waiting for someone to bring them over. They're a bit dubious at the open ground if you recall what Bolson told us. I'll find them and fetch them over. <laughs> Alas, my enthusiasm led to a most unfortunate occurrence. My mistake, I encountered not the intended audience of dignitaries, but instead the band of rogues and outcasts. It was these I led unwittingly to their seats in the auditorium. singers retire to the wings, leaving Dame Isabel alone on the stage with me. Ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you to our little performance. You are about to see the opera Fidelio by Ludwig van Beethoven, one of our most accomplished composers. We bring you this programme in the hope that some of you may wish to learn more about the great music of Earth.
first the rogues sit in stunned silence as their honour is insulted by the cast in the pelts of their ancestors and the solo soprano waving a blasphemous yellow scarf. Bolson bursts in and is aghast, but too late. is once more in space. In Dame Isabel's cabin, where she suffers anew from space sickness, she is planning the next leg of the trip with Captain Gondar and myself. avoid the mistakes we made on Sirius Planet. According to our itinerary, we will next visit Zaid, the second planet of Phi Orionis. I understand that the Autochthones are definitely humanoid. Is that not so, Bernard? I have not visited the world myself, but I am told the inhabitants of Zaid are not only humanoid in appearance, but also display cultural traits analogous to our own, including art forms based on a modulation of sound, which is to say, music. Zaid it is, then. I presume, Captain, that our route will not take us too far afield from Rularu. No, no difficulty there. Fire Ryan is in the general direction. But I have a suggestion. Yes? I recall mention of a planet in Hydra, named Yarn, inhabited by a very musical people. It's a world which has hardly been visited by man, and I understand it, it's extremely advanced artistically. Just the place for you to take your troop board, so it seems to me. Our present itinerary, according to you, takes us towards Rlaru. Is this not correct? Yes, indeed, absolutely correct. Come to think of it, Gondar. Don't you think it's about time you let us in on the location of Rolaru? Better that I keep my own counsel for a very good reason. But suppose something happened to you. 
then we'd be unable to find Rolaru, which is our principal goal. I fail to understand your reluctance to trust us. You certainly can't believe that we would attempt to bamboozle you. Of course not. And I'm sorry if I gave that impression. Why, then, are you so unnaturally cautious? I'll be quite frank. You put matters on the basis of trust, but your demands for information make it quite clear that you do not trust me. This arouses in me a counter-distrust. You control a great deal of money which is rightfully mine, and this is leverage which you exert on me. I have information you want, and this is my leverage upon you. You are asking me to give up my leverage to put myself in your power without making a corresponding concession. What you say may be sensible on Earth, but out here, en route to Lurlaru, what do you gain? Both Mr. Bickle and I are persons of honour. I can't imagine us, for the sake of argument, marooning you, or to be really melodramatic, causing your death. Stranger things have happened. When the time comes, I will take you to Rolaru. When the time comes, I hope that you in your turn will give me my money. Now, as to the matter of the planet I mentioned, I believe a visit to this planet would be highly rewarding. We would be forced to make a tedious detour. A slight detour, perhaps, but a very rewarding one. An old explorer described it to me. Ever since, I have wanted to visit this planet. You must do so on some other occasion. Our current itinerary is already established. We cannot jerk here and there about the galaxy to satisfy one person's whim. Kindly inform the Astrogator that our immediate destination is Zaid, second planet of Phi Orionis. Odd. Why in the name of all the lesser demons is Gondor so anxious to visit this particular world? It makes small difference, since we shall not be doing so. The rehearsal area is dimly lit. Maddock Roswin is sitting alone when Roger enters. I wish you'd tell me why you acted the way you did. Told those terrible stories about me. It seemed a good thing at the time. You must recognise, Roger, that I am fickle and perverse. Not at all the girl you thought I was. I can't escape the feeling that you were using me. But to what end, I can't imagine. Once I thought you were fond of me. If you were, if you still are, for heaven's sake tell me, and we'll clear up this terrible misunderstanding. I wish you'd tell me why you acted that way. As if I'd ever force you to do anything against your will. There's no misunderstanding, Roger. How can anyone so beautiful, so sensitive, so clever, be so faithless? I can't understand. It's not necessary that you understand, Roger. Roger leaves disconsolately. The ship... Once again, encapsulated in non-stuff like a worm in an oak gall. Slides onward through space towards the star Phi Orionis and its planet, Zaid. The opera cast join Maddock in the rehearsal area as they prepare for landing.
Down on planet Zade, we meet in Dame Isabel's cabin with Darwin Litchley, a guide and interpreter. The natives of Zade are by and large neither hostile nor uncooperative. They are simply unpredictable. There are at least 16 variations of intelligent species, much more disparate than the races of man, and with their differences of colour and anatomy go cultural differences. I couldn't even begin to generalise on them. There are humanoid people? Oh yes indeed, no question about that. From a distance of a hundred yards, you can hardly distinguish one from a man. And I understand they are, in a sense, artists. That is to say, they understand the creative process, the sublimation of fact to symbol, and the use of symbol to suggest emotion. Absolutely. Though here again, there is great diversity of ways and means. One of the peculiar facts of life on Zaid is the lack of cultural interchange. Each tribe, except for the occasional slave raid, ha takes very little notice of its neighbours. In general, the folk of Zaid are no more and no less to be feared than the people of Earth. And herein lies the unpredictability of Zaid. We are not exactly greenhorns, and naturally we will make every conceivable allowance for native peculiarities. I would be happy if you could arrange a suitable itinerary for us so that we could play before those tribes which would profit the most. I can suggest an itinerary. I cannot arrange one. Our situation here by no means affords us automatic respect. Certain of the tribes are sure Earth is a place of desolation and misery. You have explained your objectives, and while I applaud them in the abstract... I fear that problems of a lower level, the sheer ponderosity of the project, are almost certain to cause misunderstanding and difficulty. You are a peculiarly confident man, Mr Litchley. After weeks of meticulous planning, dedicated rehearsals and not inconsiderable expense, as well as a voyage across many miles of space, we are finally here on Zade, prepared to present our programme. You now make your pessimistic enunciations and apparently envision us reeling back in doubt and dismay, abandoning all our plans and returning to Earth. Madam, you misunderstand me. I merely hope to present a realistic picture, in order that you should have no reason to reproach me later for irresponsibility. The peoples of Zaid, while intelligent, are rather narrow in their perspective, and some are both uncertain and unreliable, and even volatile. Very well, you have made your point. Now, let us examine the maps I see you have brought. We are here. I have described the extreme diversity of the local Aborigines. The striads of the Tercera zone are perhaps as good as any to visit first, and undoubtedly they are a picturesque folk, highly expert in the use of sound, which they project from an organ unique to them. Very well. Yeah. We shall present Mozart's magic flute to the striads. There will be no tampering or adjustment. It's like somehow of condescension to make these unpleasant little compromises. I recommend you next visit the water folk. They have a highly developed music, in a tradition at least 10,000 years old. 
They are true experts, all with perfect pitch. And they will recognise offhand any chord you can play in any of its inversions. You wanted to meet a musically sophisticated people, and here they are. This is good news indeed. I fancy we can show them something they haven't seen before. Next, we shall present Alban Berg's Wozzeck to the water folk. <laughs> Darwin literally had recommended the striads. Yes. The stage is set as Sarastro's temple from Magic Flute as Papageno and Pamina approach. The audience of striads file in and sit in complete silence. <laughs> up and grabs the conductor's baton, abruptly bringing the opera to a halt. Darwin literally translates the words the striad mutters in her ears. Okay. There seems to be a slight mistake, a certain degree of misunderstanding. They seem to have mistaken the Phoebus for a commercial mission. They are willing to place a firm order for two oboists and a coloratura. <laughs> Thank you. Litchley's next recommendation was the water folk, those musical experts for whom we had prepared Wozzeck. Yes, the stage is set as a tavern where Wozzeck sees Marie dancing with the tambour major. <laughs> the audience consists of one lone Zaid who sits in silence. Under Thank you. 
Driven by who knows what impulse, jumps up, seizes the baton from the conductor, and sings the part of Andres. He stops the orchestra and speaks. Literally translates. He's unfavorably impressed. This essentially is his reaction. He has noticed a large number of clumsy mistakes. The singers, hmm, a word I don't understand. Whatever it means, it's something the singers do in attempting to go. He thinks they should hop, the, yes, hop the, and jump. He, a fast he has set his fee at 600 flashlight batteries. If this is not paid, he will infect the Phoebus with approximately 10 million drug. of his infants. is once more in space, in Dame Isabel's cabin, where she is once more suffering space sickness. Captain Gondar is also looking unwell. He has dark shadows under his eyes, and his skin has a yellow tone. to anyone, and somehow I cannot read animus into that terrible set of circumstances. Probably not. A misunderstanding more than likely. Faulty communication. What a farcical chap that Lichley, 
Utterly incompetent. He frankly admitted his incompetence in the language. You should take more exercise, Captain Gondar. Even in this age of biological miracles, we must cooperate by keeping the blood moving. A short while ago, I mentioned a civilised and cultured planet called Yan. Yes, I remember distinctly. To visit the planet would entail an onerous detour. Some small distance, perhaps. A matter of veering off into Hydra, a civilised and cultured planet! Captain, this planet no doubt merits a visit. But we have a schedule, judiciously, even laboriously arrived at, and we simply cannot pursue every will of the wisp that offers itself. If I were you, I would consult Dr Shand and ask him for a tonic. I feel you must be driving yourself too hard. In my opinion, Captain Gondar's little affaire du coeur is not proceeding with rose petal facility, as Carvart puts it. What a heartless little wretch she is. First poor Roger, and now Captain Gondar. Maddock is alone in her cabin when Roger enters. Come in. Have you eaten? Tell me why. I'm born of secretive people. All my life I've had secrets you never dream of. This planet Yan is one of your secrets. Secrecy is a miserable vice. I have no secrets whatever. You are indeed an admirable man, Roger. Very well. I'll tell you my secret.
Turn to Jan. For as long as I can remember, I went to sleep by this song. help you as best I can. I can't do something I never had. I'll talk to my aunt. Roger leaves Maddox's cabin and enters Dame Isabel's cabin. Consider me a wastrel, and credit me with little judgment. Do I not have reason to do so? You brought that dreadful woman aboard the Phoebus. She has disrupted the entire tour. Yes, quite true. Her motive for wanting to visit this particular world is astonishing. I do not wish to be astonished. I've had enough surprises. I suppose in simple justice I must speak to the wretched woman. Where is she? Maddock enters. She talks earnestly to Isabel. Isabel rings for her steward. Please tell Captain 
and Gondar to step in here for a moment, if you'll be so good. I have decided to convey Miss Roswin to the planet Yan. On planet Yan, ship's company assembled on the edge of a dense forest.
off into the forest. Madoc has run off into the forest. Roger curses and follows. rapidly through space, now nearing Rolaru. Dame Isabel is standing by her desk in her cabin, attended by the increasingly shifty Captain Gondar and myself. The Rolaru inhabitants are friendly. Friendly? You saw the Ninth Company. Did they seem unfriendly? No, of course not. Though I have always considered their abrupt departure ungracious in view of our efforts. I believe you stated that you had photographed the planet? Did I say that? Yes, during our original negotiations. I don't recall. I would now like to be shown the photographs. There can be no possible reason for further caution. These are hardly informative. You have nothing depicting the people, their cities, their architecture, their rituals? No, I did not take the camera from the ship. The inhabitants gave you a hospitable greeting? You seem a trifle uncertain. Not at all. Although hospitable isn't quite the right word. They accepted me without much interest of any kind. Weren't they surprised to see you? Difficult to say. They showed no great interest in me. Did they show curiosity in regard to Earth or your spaceship? No, not to any great extent. Gondar sidles out of the cabin leaving Isabel and I to ponder his evasive and enigmatic remarks. Hmm. One would think them a stolid or stupidly introverted people, were it not for the evidence of the Ninth Company to the contrary. (laughs) 
Suddenly, Roger Wall, De Appling, and Hedison burst in, holding Captain Gondar as a struggling prisoner. Roger holds the gun. He has taken off Gondar. I suddenly became anxious to leave the ship. Please conduct Mr. Gonda to his cabin. Make sure he has no further weapons. Mr. Henderson, you will see that a suitable lock is attached to the door. Gonda is frog marched out in handcuffs. Mr. Deerpling, we will land at Rlaru. We will land at Rlaru at the original site. I see no reason to be intimidated by Mr. Gonda's ambiguous lands on Rlaru. On planet Rlaru, a golden haze of late afternoon, tranquil and beautiful, though permeated with a sense of remoteness and even melancholy, like a scene remembered from one's youth. Rlaru inhabitants inspect the ship, then leave. Their lack of interest is almost insulting. Did you notice their physical characteristics? Extremely manlike, yet in some subtle, almost indefinable manner, not quite men. What, in your expert opinion, would seem an appropriate work to perform here? I find it difficult to decide. Frankly, I, I had expected a far different cultural complex. An ambiance considerably more lively and sophisticated. 
My feelings exactly. There seems an aimlessness here, a lack of purpose, as if people and landscape aren't exactly real. Perhaps archaic is the word I want. But everything exudes a redolence of something old and half forgotten. Both of you seem to have evaded the question. I evade because I am at a loss. I talk, hoping to stimulate an idea into existence. But I have failed. Why not flee into Hollander or Parsifal? Either of these would be suitable. Of course, there is always the risk of tedium, especially for persons not imbued with the Wagnerian mystique. I consider it a calculated risk. The level of musical sophistication is high. We must not forget this. Good. This evening we shall perform Parsifal and hope that the sound of the music will attract an audience. Andre, please see to bringing out the requisite sets. Bernard, perhaps you would be so good as to inform Sir Henry and his people. The crew set up the Parsifal set, the cast assemble, and the opera commences. magically spirited from his prison by the dancers, bound and gagged, and carried out prone and shoulder high in a solemn procession. Return to the ship. Dame Isabel confers with Bickle. 
It is beyond my understanding. We have no further business here on Rlaru. We will leave in the morning. What of Adolf Gondar? It is clear he committed a wrong against these people. Clearly he had been warned never again to approach Rlaru. When he did so, he was punished. His fate is out of our hands. Could they spirit him out of his cabin? Through the solid walls of the ship? Why not? It is amply clear they brought the Ninth Company back from Earth. Why should they not extract Mr. Gondar from his cabin? It is beyond my understanding. Mine too. We have no further business here on Rolaru. We will leave in the morning. Roger and Paddock are left alone. They watch the dawn on Rolaru. This is such a soothing place, Roger. Maddock walks off.
Bless the green returns to Earth, limping back along the space lanes. At last we return to Mother Earth to face the scheduled press conference with a crowd of eager <laughs> journalists. <laughs> and to show off Maddox's enormous <laughs> engagement ring. Much from us, and we from them. <laughs> <laughs> 